Margie. Hello. I guess that's too dark. Hmm. There's Margie Flood. Yay. I think. You notice, Jen, he wasn't excited about seeing you or me. Well, I'm of course he I'm excited. He saw me like 20 seconds ago. I can't expect him to be excited. I am about. just excited about seeing you folks by default. There we go. <laughs> Good recovery. Yeah. No, I'm impressed. I worked on that all day. <laughs> it was planned. Uh, let's see here. What am I doing? Here we go. That'll work. Margie, are you hearing us okay? I don't think so. Thinking yet. I'm going to throw something in the chat and see if that okay. helps. Yes, I just put these in. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yay. Welcome. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Sorry, I'm uh, just still kind of scattered trying to pull myself in to focus. How are you folks doing? Doing okay. Good. Sorry about that. I didn't have my earphone in. I tell oh, you, no, modern it's technology. Oh, and you weren't saying hello back, so we figured something was up. <laughs> Checking my email, making sure my camera's working, you know, all these things. <laughs> Isn't technology fun? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Hey, I had a nice chat with the person who's calling folks about your strategic plan and things like that. Oh, good. That was a good interview today. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I look forward to hearing what you had to say. <laughs> you gonna give me a teaser? Yeah. It's like, 
It's all about the staff, really. That's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It is. And most of them are pretty okay. <laughs> Actually, that was the only concern I expressed, which was, I can remember back when I first came to Oberlin that there were some staffing issues years and years and way back, way, way, way back. Um, and then since then, it's been absolutely wonderful. I, my concern has been, you know, what happens when inevitably some really great staff people decide to retire or move on or whatever? Um, it, the staff is, uh, is hugely important to OCS. And I think OCS has been great at attracting great staff, um, but. Yep, yep. Anything we can do to keep Kathy, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so David, how long have you been in Oberlin, dare I ask? I'm in year 18. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And I can see Bob Longsworth. That is the first time I've seen your face in months. And boy, is it good to see you. <laughs> good to see all of you as well. <laughs> I think I recognize everybody there. And Carol is with me. She's just hiding behind here a bit. <laughs> good to see you too, Carol. <laughs> you, you're used to my face, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <clears throat> We can only see Rollins' right eye. Oh, there he has a left eye. <laughs> How come my face doesn't go over into your square? <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I tuned into to Zoom with my parents every Sunday at six, and uh, we they do this routine that I now affectionately regard as the Zoom shuffle because my mother gets the computer all up and running, but she wants my father to be closer to the screen. So she's like, okay. And then they do this elaborate trading of places and they never do it the same way twice. And I'm always holding my breath that somebody's gonna trip and fall down or something's going to happen, but it always works. And I know that every other Sunday school session, I will start looking around the corner because some kid will be like half in, half out of the window and I'm, I'm like trying to see them. And I'm like, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, I like it when people are in rooms, the, the, the windows abut one another where the, the backgrounds kind of run into one another where they'll have bookshelves and, you know, and it looks like they're in the same room. It's kind of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, did you did you think of a, a word for the muttering you do when you're trying to get your technology to work on Sunday morning? <laughs> yeah, um, I had a phrase. Wait for a you. minute. You can't use those words. <laughs> no, he, he said that's why he does this. So he doesn't say those words. Yes, it's your pastor talking himself, you know, away from the cliff. <laughs> <Off the cliff. laughs> Whenever anything was really going bad in, in band and I, you know, the kids are right in front of me. So I would say crumb bucket. Mm. <laughs> that was my, that was my go-to phrase. My dad always <laughs> said, dad gum it. <laughs> so what I will always remember was in my first church in Jefferson, I was also the choir director for the first five years and I was revert rehearsing the choir oh, probably a week or two before Christmas and things were not going well. And at one point I looked at the choir and I said, I hate Christmas. And then looked behind yeah. me and I saw three of the children of one of the choir members <laughs> sitting in the back. <laughs> oh dear. Whoops. <laughs> I seem to remember having a rule with my kids about what I called pseudo swearing for a while because it had gotten so, you know, so many dad gummits and what, I don't know what all it was where I'm like, okay, I don't want to hear about fudge anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my early jobs was as a, uh, I was at the pastor responsible for youth at a pretty good sized church. And we took them on a wilderness canoe trip <laughs> every uh, summer up in Algonquin in Canada. And uh, it's really hard work if you've ever done that. And so 
we would we would realize we needed to make a rule before we took off to try not to swear because after all we're the youth workers and they're the kids and we, we probably should set a better example and inevitably we came across some challenge that caused that resolution to go out the window <laughs> within the first hour or within yeah. the first day <laughs> sometimes with the first step <laughs> Well, as we continue to gather, I, I, I know that we have one person connecting by phone. I believe that's Sharon Schwank. How are you, Sharon? Can you hear us? Just fine. I can hear you all fine. Yes. Thank Wonderful. you. Um, I did have, you know, we can continue along these informal lines. There's doesn't need to be that much structure, but I did have a question for you this evening uh, just to get us started, which was, what was one thing you thought you would miss during COVID that you really didn't miss? To who is did that question addressed? All of you. Anybody can jump <laughs> in. <laughs> Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> I am surprised by how much I enjoy working out of my home <laughs> and not having to have to go to the office, even though it requires a lot of screen time. It's like there is so much time in my day back, mm. you know, by not having to have to commute and I don't have to pack my lunch and I don't have to fill the car up every couple of days or whatever it was. And it's just um, like, it's pretty amazing yeah. that I can like be in my pajamas and then be at work 15 minutes later or five minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> you should be showing up. Good participants. Other folks, something that you thought you would miss, but you didn't end up missing. I think Saturday morning breakfast, a big, big um, eggs and bacon breakfast. I thought I would miss going down to um, the little local cafe and, and having that. But, you know, I only thought about it once so, and it was a fleeting <laughs> thought. <laughs> For me, it was going out to eat because mm -hmm. we did that quite often and then all of a sudden nothing yeah. and going to the grocery store. You know, we lived right around the corner. So, you know, you need something, you go over there. Well, my wife and I decided only one of us should go and we should only go once every couple of weeks. So I may make it there once a month. And I really didn't miss that. So. Other than that, I missed a lot. <laughs> I thought I was more of an extrovert than it turned out to be. So I thought I was going to miss all these interactions, and I do miss some of them. But I've certainly enjoyed having fewer of them, and I'll have to admit it makes me a bit anxious when I think of us all coming back at once. I, I picture just <laughs> hordes of people overwhelming First Church. <laughs> no way to ease into that. <laughs> so for those of you just joining us, we're just pondering for a moment the question, what was one thing you thought you would miss during COVID that you really didn't end up missing? Okay, thanks. Ralph and I are trying to get in here, but we can't seem to get the video to work. So we're going to go try a different computer. Okay, thanks, Becky. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you. We'll see if we can make this work better. Okay. At the beginning of, of course, we moved right at the beginning of all this, and and we also sold our second car, which I thought would be terrible. You know, how would we coordinate having only one car? <laughs> <laughs> and then no one, no one went anywhere. So, <laughs> right. so I didn't miss it at all. Well, again, welcome, folks. I think we'll get started this evening. Um, so this is uh, session number three of this five-part series on wilderness wanderings. Our, our scripture passage this evening comes from Leviticus, 
which is a book of the Bible that I imagine most folks probably haven't read all the way through and generally don't spend much time studying. Uh, for some progressive Protestants, it is a book to be avoided because it contains some of the so-called clobber texts that have been used to condemn homosexuality and same-sex marriage. It has also been used to comic delight as some progressives have responded to more conservative folks such as Dr. Laura with this letter that has circulated through the uh, internet year after year. I will just hit a few highlights just for our amusement tonight. Dear Dr. Laura, when I burn a bowl on the altar as a sacrifice, I know it creates a pleasing odor for the Lord. The problem is my neighbors, they claim the odor is not pleasing to them. Should I smite them? Um, <laughs> dear Dr. Laura, Leviticus 25, 44 states that I may indeed possess slaves, both male and female, provided they are purchased from neighboring nations. A friend of mine claims that this applies to Mexicans, but not Canadians. Can you clarify why can't I own Canadians? <laughs> <laughs> and one more, although this letter goes on and on. Dear Dr. Laura, I know from Leviticus 11, 6 to 8, that touching the skin of a dead pig makes me unclean, but may I still play football if I wear gloves? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. That said, there is much more to Leviticus. It is actually, first and foremost, a book of worship. We see this in the title Leviticus, which refers to the Levitical priests who were set apart to minister at the sanctuary. Embedded with these priestly instructions, we find the Holiness Code, which is chapter 17 to 26, which extends the notion of holiness of being set apart by God to include not just priests, but all of God's people, Israel. Tonight's reading is a portion of chapter 19, which focuses on holiness in neighborliness and concludes with the familiar phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. As those called to holiness by God, what does it mean to be neighbors to one another. So I invite you to hear this text from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 to 18. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor, I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall not reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. As you reflect on this passage, I invite you to think of a time when someone was a neighbor to you in your time of need. What did it feel like to receive this generosity? How willing are you to acknowledge your needs and to ask others for assistance?
I think I can start this one. Okay. Um, I remember right after my first child was born, uh, Nick was extremely colicky. And I was extremely overwhelmed. And someone from my church at the time came over and brought me soup. And I nearly fell at her feet in gratitude. Um, just because not only was it soup, it was an actual other human adult to talk to. And there hadn't been a lot of that. Plus it actually, there was the other complicating factor was that Nick was born six days before 9-11. So I was overwhelmed in about six different ways. And so I remember turning to Sue and just being so grateful and her giving me the soup and then backing away slowly because she was a little bit surprised at how effusive I was. Um, but it was still a lovely thing to have another human being in the room for a little bit. Thanks, Jen. Others that would like to share about a time uh, when you were in need and received help or support from a neighbor and how willing are you to acknowledge your needs and to ask others for assistance? Well, go ahead, Ann. Oh, yeah. you're, you're yeah. muted. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was out riding my bike in the country several years ago, and uh, I was uh, south of Kipton on Baird Road, which is quite a ways away, and uh, I looked, and the sky was getting really threatening, and I figured I, if I can get back to Kipton, they have a shelter there, so I put as much speed as my legs would allow into the bike, and I kept really pedaling as hard as I could. And all of a sudden, I'd say the temperature dropped about 17, 20 degrees, just ice cold. And I knew I was in trouble. Um, so I looked and I was passing a house and I pulled in the driveway and stood on the porch as the sky just let loose with everything. And uh, a young guy <clears throat> came out and saw me. And I, and I just said, you know, I hope you don't mind. I just need to get out of the storm. And he invited me in, and um, that storm lasted, uh, oh, I'd say it was a whole hour. And um, I stayed in there, and he was watching the game show on TV, and his wife was there in the living room. And by that time, it was quite dark, and uh, the storm had subsided. And I was thinking I was going to have to ride my way back to Overland in the dark when he offered to put my bike in his truck and drive me home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, wow, that's really generous. I didn't expect that at all. Um, so he was he really saved me <laughs> from, from being out in that storm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ralph. Hand Sprague? Sure. Um, my life right now is an example of that. Um, I mean, I was raised to be fiercely independent, and you don't, um, you don't, you don't um, ask much of other people if you can help it. And the other people always come first. And um, my life for the last three and a half months, or six months, or a year, depending on how you want to look at it, has been challenging. And the bottom line is I couldn't have gotten through all of this without the help of people being supportive. And I've, I've actually had to change how I approach looking at other people and asking them, you know, I need you to help me through this, which I'm not sure I've ever done before. Um, it's been a, an interesting journey to, to not only need the help, but to accept it and to welcome it um, and feel the support of, of people who, who want to do that, which is another really interesting side to it is the people who want to be my, my neighbors. Um, 
it's been a an interesting education and a and a wonderful one. So. Thanks, Anne. Okay. I think for me it was nineteen seventy six. My first uh, marriage went south, and she left me on Christmas Eve. And I had to drive her from Fort Campbell, or actually Clarksville, Tennessee, all the way up to Louisville to drop her at her brother's house. And I was faced with going back in the cold and the snow at night. And I said, I didn't want to do that. I didn't have any money for a hotel or anything. So I called up the only other person in Louisville I knew who was my old college roommate. And I said, do you have an extra bed I could just crash in tonight? And he said, well, let me talk to my wife because he had just gotten married. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll meet you in two hours in this parking lot and then I'll take you over to the house. So I was able to find it and he took me over. I walked in, his wife threw, he gave me a big hug and a Christmas present. Oh. And, <laughs> and that just, that opened my eyes to what real friendship is all about. It's, it's not what people do for you when everything's going great. It's when you're at your lowest ebb and you put out a hand and you see who grabs it on the other end. Thanks, Steve. I, I have a memory of uh, my second year in in college, I was I was volunteering as a student summer missionary for the Southern Baptist Convention. I was going to school in Oklahoma, and and um, and at that time was um, um, affiliated with the Southern Baptist Church. And uh, for my assignment, uh, we had to come uh, up to Erie, Pennsylvania, and go in teams to um, to a Roman Catholic neighborhood and attempt to convert the people who lived there. Well, I went out um, to my neighborhood. It was a very hot day. It was just scorching hot and humid. And I knocked on the door. My I was so dry from the heat um, that my my voice cracked when I started to talk to the the woman who answered the door and uh, I began to proselytize and she um, she looked at me and then she disappeared into her house for a couple of minutes and when she returned she had a glass of cold water and offered it to me and I learned, it didn't really dawn on me at the time. I didn't really see the connection. Um, but later on, when I reflected on the verse, um, you, if, if you need water, um, ask the Lord. And I thought, you know, I think I've learned who's proselytizing whom. <laughs> and uh, that, that woman is forever in my memory that she offered me a glass of water on that hot, hot day. Thanks, Sharon. Asking for help is not my strong suit. I usually have to be driven to the breaking point before that happens. Um, an early example was that was my after my freshman year in college, I was driving a special interest vehicle across country to a new owner, and it broke down on the Will Rogers Turnpike. And um, there were no cell phones then. I was out on my own. I put the back tailgate up and I put a red shirt on it, thinking people would stop by to help me. And they thought the car was so cool, they just kept driving by and waving at me and smiling. <laughs> um, I'd never hitchhiked in my life. I'd been pretty much instructed against that. Um, and so I decided I would venture out with my first hitchhiking experience. And so I stuck my thumb out 
And the first car that came along was a pickup truck. And I hopped into the cab and it turned out it was a missionary on his way to Mexico who took me to the midterm bike uh, plaza, dropped me off there where I could use a payphone to call AAA and get to a hotel. Um, <laughs> just, but it, I remember at the time, it took me a long time to get to the point of sticking my thumb out. It was the last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, Becky, go ahead. I'm relating to Ann and you're sharing tonight. Um, after losing um, mom, uh, I had done a lot of caring for mom for the last eight years. And actually Ralph and I had done a lot for dad and mom over the last 30 years. And so it was quite a change. Um, and mom and I had grown quite a bit closer in the last few years of her life, which was a tremendous gift to me. Um, but anyway, in my struggle, I decided to reach out to three really close girlfriends. And I called each one and each of us then talked, they shared about their mom and their relationship with their moms and how they were managing, um, how they had managed and how they were managing their dad and how they were going forward. And uh, we had wonderful conversations. And uh, that's not common for me to do. I heard several of you say that. And I, I'm better at um, listening with people regarding those matters than I am sharing with people in those matters, even though I have practiced quite a bit in the last few years with my closest friends. And um, I just have felt really warmed when I've done it. And I did this to you. Thanks, Becky. Mm -hmm. Anyone else tonight before we move to our guest presenter? So I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, Margie Flood. Margie grew up in Oberlin, daughter of church members, Bob and Carol Longsworth, who are tuned in this evening. She and her husband, Rick Flood, who is the son of church members, Dennis and Sue Flood, got married in First Church 35 years ago. After many years away working and homeschooling three children, Margie and her family moved back to Oberlin in 2010 when she started working part-time at Oberlin Community Services. She now serves as the executive director there. Uh, Oberlin Community Services is a community-based organization that offers caring support through food and other emergency assistance, educational opportunities, and more to people in Southern Lorain County who seek help meeting basic needs. So welcome, Margie. We are delighted you're with us this evening. Thank you, David. And I, yeah, I'm really struck by this uh, conversation about uh, when people have needs and how hard it is to ask and how good it is to share. Um, so thanks for inviting me to share this evening, this Lenten series of wandering through the wilderness. I sometimes feel like uh, that's what we've all been doing for a year now, trying to navigate a uh, chart a course through unknown territory. Um, and what a year it has been for all of us, right? Um, so we've all seen the stories on the news, the huge unemployment numbers, long lines at food distributions, women and children, especially hard hit. Um, before that, Pre-COVID in 2019, research showed that in the United States, a third of all U.S. households didn't have enough savings to survive a crisis of three months. It's been a lot longer than three months now. Um, even in our local midst, recent data, but again, pre-COVID, indicated that poverty in Oberlin itself could be as high as 28% or more. Um, before COVID, about half the people in our county made less than a living wage, not poverty, not 200% of poverty even, but still less than a living wage. So after all the businesses that have closed or may yet close due to COVID, parents having to give up jobs to school their children at home, um, I think we're, we are still seeing only the beginning of the economic impact that COVID uh, may have on friends and neighbors in our community. Although today's a good day, the America Rescue Act was signed. Um, there's a lot of hope there, a lot of hope 
um, with, with what, is, what the future may bring. But we know people are struggling, right? We know kids go to bed hungry and parents worry they can't sleep because they're worrying how they'll pay the bills. Um, and yet, as each of us has said tonight, it is so hard to ask for help especially here in the United States where we have this pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality, or as Anne Sprague said, you know, the rugged individual stiff upper lip. Um, so you're somehow a failure if you can't make it on your own, right? If you have to ask for help, something is wrong with you that you, um, and I think that shame is real, that difficulty is real, just as judgment is real. I can remember when I was, uh, when Rick and I were fairly newly married and we have to, had two little tots and I would go to the local grocery store with my food stamps. Um, and when I paid, I was just very aware of the eyes and the judgment of when I pulled out those food stamps, no longer were they cute kids. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was just, there was shame. Well. I felt like I knew I was going to, this was temporary. So I don't know how much shame I felt, but I definitely felt the judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so don't judge as Le um, Leviticus says, do not render judgment because you don't know how hard it was for someone even to get out of bed this morning. Um, but on to Leviticus and the gleaners. <laughs> the passage reminds me of that scene in Gone with the Wind where um, Scarlett O'Hara, the, the heroine, is walking through the fields of Tara and um, she sees a carrot and she, in desperation, goes down and grabs that carrot out of the dirt, pulls it up and shakes it at God and says, I will never go hungry again. And it's like the pivotal moment for Scarlett and um, as she gleans. So, Something that strikes me about this Leviticus thing about gleaning is um, that what Leviticus says is leave some of your abundance for others. That is, be generous by not taking everything and then let others fend for themselves with what you have left there for them. So it isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily doing a handout it's leaving something and giving the gleaners agency for themselves. So as I reflect on this passage um, and OCS's role in the community, um, I guess I think of OCS as being Oberlin's equivalent of the fields of Leviticus. Um, OCS does literally get leftovers, right? Second harvest from second harvest from grocery stores, from people's cupboards. Um, from farmer's fields. And then we take those and redistribute them to people whose cupboards are bare. So, um, but people who struggle still need to reach out to us in order to get those things. We need to know that they are there and they need to have that agency, I guess, to, to come see us. Uh, although we do try to make it as easy as possible um, and as self-empowering as possible, uh, as much as we can, much harder to do in contact-free COVID times, but um, dignity, hope, self-respect, all of those are so crucial. And I think your, your stories about being helped by others um, show that too, right? That you're, the people who, who did reach out to help you treated you with respect and care, um, not with downturn noses. <laughs> So I think Oberlin is doing a beautiful job, a beautiful job of leaving food in the fields, so to speak, by supporting OCS. I feel so thankful for the outpouring of generosity um, that the community has shown towards um, OCS and therefore towards neighbors in the community. The desire to share with those who've been hit by this misfortune during this past year and OCS is doing a lot, I just have to say. <laughs> we help with utility bills, rent, mortgage, other basic bills that people are having struggling to pay. We have so many food programs, I'm not gonna name them all, 
Um, also, Marsha Jones is the president of our board, so um, she may have some things to add here too. Um, we actually do have a literal cleaning program that started about a year ago where we started building relationships with farmers um, in the area who now um, when they have produce in their fields that, they, that, that isn't pretty enough to be sellable, then they give it to us. Sometimes we literally have to go glean it. Sometimes it's already been picked by their machines and they just have it, they've put it in the bee pile. Um, we had one, one uh, farmer, I swear he must be 90 or so, um, call us one day and say, oh, you must come, the zucchini, they are way too big. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, anyway, so last year, I think it was about 20,000 pounds of fresh produce went from uh, the fields to people's um, tables. So that is successful gleaning. Uh, we also have Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon food distributions. We do pop-up pantries, which is where we drive fill our little truck with um, a bunch of fresh vegetables and we go to somewhere like Dollar General or another food desert area and we just put the vegetables out and say, come, take what you need um, to try to encourage people to have access to nutritious food that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, we have a new pilot pro program at uh, Oberlin High School a little food pantry there to help teenagers who are struggling that, that, that don't have food at home to, to go home to. Um, we're doing, we deliver to seniors and we just started, I do need to share this because it's really important that, that all of you know this for during COVID, we are starting to deliver to people who are quarantining. So if there is somebody who, um, particularly of course, if they struggle financially, and they have to quarantine for whatever reason for a couple of weeks and need food, um, let us know and we will take them some food, leave it on the doorstep uh, for them. So that's it. That's what OCS does. I guess um, in closing, um, perhaps what I hope you will take away most from my ramblings is you really do never know what people are going through. Um, so be kind and don't render judgment. Um, and that there are people in your midst, in our midst, uh, members of this congregation, perhaps even, maybe even friends of yours um, who may be really struggling right now, but they are having a hard time asking for help. Uh, even if it looks like they have a nice car or they have a nice home, you just don't know. So um, know that OCS is here get the, help us get the word out. We really are a field of abundance um, where folks can come and help themselves confidentially, fairly anonymously, and we will treat them as friends. Thanks. Thank you, Margie, much appreciated. So, you know, picking up on a couple of things you've mentioned, um, oftentimes I have folks that are reaching out to various churches in the county about um, need. And one of the struggles I find as pastor at First Church is I'm probably the last person that's going to hear from a parishioner that's in any mm. sort of financial crisis. Oh, wow. Um, I sometimes hear things in the wind, but rarely directly. And I think it gets to your, some of your comments about, um, I think if you're middle class, so to speak, and have had the benefit of a college education, there can be this sense that if you're in need, you must have screwed up somehow and that you're not, you're not deserving of other people's help or you're embarrassed to ask for it. Um, so you know, one of the questions in my mind is, how do I help people feel more at ease with that? And I think one of the questions some people have is, well, if this is sort of my status, do I even have a, a right to go ask for help at OCS? And how could OCS actually help me? Aren't they gonna look at me and say, well, you're not you know, below the poverty line. Who are you to come over here and ask for help? Um, could you address that? Because I know at least in the, I mean, I think the practice has been that, especially when it comes to food, nobody goes away hungry. Um, but can you talk about like sort of what happens when somebody comes that typically would have been on the helping to support OCS end? Um, what happens when they come to OCS and how they navigate that? Yeah, that's, a, that's really insightful, David. Um, 
we we don't turn people away so. um yeah never for food and um uh our feeling is if you come to ask for help you must need the help um because it's so hard to ask for help right um so we don't yeah we don't ask for financial proof of of how poor you are um never ever want anybody to feel like they are less of a person um we uh, try to we have a fantastic fantastic client service coordinator social worker who talks with individuals of course nobody comes to ocs not right now except to the parking lot so it's mostly th over the phone mm -hmm. um but uh she just talks with them tries to find out what's going on what's caused where they are now i mean why are they calling mm -hmm. maybe they're calling because they haven't paid a utility bill but without saying, well, why didn't you pay the bill? Um, she tries to figure out, well, what led you to this point that you can, couldn't pay your bill? And sometimes they're just really heart-wrenching stories. And sometimes they are, yes, your middle-class people who've lost their jobs or lost a spouse and then and home, had to school the kids at home. And then, so they couldn't do their own job. And um, navigating the world of unemployment and government help. Oh my goodness. It's hard work and takes a lot of time. These welfare moms, it's a full-time job if you have to be a welfare mom. Um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, we try to try to figure out what it, what is the real need here? Not just the, in the, the bill, but are there other things we can do other resources to connect you to? Um, right now we're seeing a lot of mental health issues. Um, it's hard. This, it's been a really hard year for people. Um, but anybody can come who feels like they are in crisis and they just need some help to get through it. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Are there other folks who may have questions or just comments or thoughts or reflections on our conversation together this evening? I, yes, I, hadn't thought, I hadn't thought of this until our meeting, but I'm wondering, Margie, if, if there is a need in our community for people that can't pay for the prescriptions, mm -hmm. uh, things like maybe uh, insulin for, for diabetes or medications for their children. Um, do you have a, a sense of what you know, status is like that? That is that is something that we do help with. Um, in the past, we haven't helped with regular medications like, um, you know, ongoing stuff just because we can't afford to do that every month for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but we do, we do help with prescriptions because you're absolutely right that that's sometimes people will choose not to buy their medication um, and buy food instead or pay their utility bill. And that can be really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, Margie, since this sort of dovetails into it, um, many churches in Oberlin help support OCS through the Churches Helping Others Fund, which has greater flexibility than some of the other grant monies that you get, which I believe sometimes has been used towards prescriptions and things that don't fit in other categories. Um, could you say a little bit about how Churches Helping Others Fund is, is used and how, how it helps OCS? The Church is Helping Others Fund is fantastic. Um, so OCS, part of the reason it was founded was because churches recognized that it was much easier to have one organization dealing with people who were in need than for the people in need to have to go to First Church today and then to the Methodist Church next week and that kind of thing and to have this centralized location. Um, so we've always worked really, really well with the churches and the Churches Helping Others Fund is crucial, very, very helpful. Um, and that is where churches like your offering, when you do an offering at, at First Church, that money goes into the Churches Helping Others Fund. Um, and yes, some of our, like our federal grant money has to go very specifically to rent or very specifically to utilities. The CHO, we call it Churches Helping Others Fund, um, is anything somebody needs. 
So yes, we can pay for prescriptions. We can pay for, sometimes we have paid for background checks or um, birth certificates for people who are looking for, who need them in order to get a job. Um, so that's, it's very, very helpful for exactly those reasons. Thank you. Others? Margie, what are the, the items that are most requested in what are some of the things uh, that are low on your shelves right now that you wish you could replenish? Hmm. Um, hmm. Well, let's see. Um, during this time of COVID, well, we, we don't have as much choice to offer people or rather they don't have much choice in what they get. Um, Long story short, but before COVID, we had a pantry that was run more like a grocery store without money. So people could just come in and take the food that they needed from the shelves. Um, with COVID, that all is, we can't let anybody in the building except staff and um, we can't have volunteers. That program relied on having lots of volunteers to restock the shelves and to help people. and. Um, so instead we do these uh, food distributions like you see Second Harvest doing. We do our own version. We give out, we give out more food and a lot more produce. Um, but anyway, uh, but unfortunately people don't have a lot of choice. So it's whatever we get in and however much we have of it, uh, we pack a big, huge box. We give them a big bag of food um, to each household in their car. Um, so in terms of what, so, People do sometimes ask for special things like gluten-free or um, vegan, and we do we are able to do that for people. Um, so I would say some of those kinds of things are always helpful to have. Um, they're harder to come by through second harvest and gleaning. Um, so that would be an idea. Um, and I think, oh golly, I was just back in the warehouse today. So, um, pre pre-prepared food like ravioli, um, the kind of stuff, especially the kind of cans that we can, um, that kids can open easily is helpful to have to give to, to our teens and kids. Um, cereal, and we also could use some cereal. So that's, those are some things that we would love to have now if you're looking to, um, looking to help us fill our shelves. But as I say, I really feel like the Oberlin community is being so generous right now. And um, we feel blessed to be able to, to share that abundance with the people who come. Bargy, do you have a relationship with other communities, either in the county? Or how are you connected to other organizations like OCS? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, OCS is, is pretty unique in the county, um, in our funding sources, in our ability to have, like CHO, for example, the Church is Helping Others Fund, um, our reach, uh, the breadth of what we are able to do. It, um, that said, we, have, we do partner with lots of different organizations. For example, just to give, name a few, we're part of a United Way collaborative with the Salvation Armies, the Catholic Charity Neighborhood Alliance uh, that does the homeless shelter and the senior center. Um, who else is in that? Uh, Neighborhood Cares, which is I think North Ridgeville's Community Cares, um, which is similar to OCS in North Ridgeville and in Avon Lake, bunch of us work together in this United Way collaborative to make sure that um, the basic idea of that particular collaborative is to make sure that people who are not usually in crisis but have gotten to the brink and they're right about to fall into poverty if they don't get help can get the help they need, which tends to be a bigger price tag than what the normal few hundred we might in a normal year might pay to somebody for rent. It's a larger chunk of money to pull them off and we can work together and share resources. 
um, to get them off the brink and then um, get them back on solid ground. Uh, so that's one, uh, one collaborative that is really, really helpful. The caseworkers talk to each other about the people they're seeing and share ideas. Um, and then the directors talk about the, the bigger picture things. So that's a, that's a good collaborative. Um, of course, we have a food rescue program with Kendall and uh, Oberlin College and places like that, that institutions that are like cafeterias that make food. If they have leftovers, they freeze it in dinner size um, portions and we get that. And then we're able to give out those pre-prepared meals. Um, so that's another partnership that we work with. That's just two of them, but we do, we try as much as we can to, um, to work with others, other um, organizations in the community. So we're not duplicating, but um, accentuating services and augmenting them. I'd like to ask a question, Margie. Do you think that the money will be coming from the federal government in this relief package that was just approved, do you think it will have much effect on your clients? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens, but I think that um, when the stimulus money comes, we're gonna see a quick drop in the number of people we're seeing until that money runs out, but then there's, the money will run out. And so um, that's what we saw when the $600 ones came back in June. All of a sudden, nobody, I mean, OCS was so quiet for a few weeks. And again, I think this speaks to our human desire to fend for ourselves. So they get a $600, they wanna pay their own food. They don't wanna come, you know, there's, somebody was talking to me, well, why don't they just get their own food and then they can save that and then they can use it for whatever, a down payment on a house or whatever. We want, we want to have our own agency. We want to take care of ourselves when we can. I think that, I think that's part of the psychology anyway. So when they get this $1,400 stimulus check, um, I think it's gonna, it's, they're gonna want to use it to, pay bills. Um, but also there's the $300 per kid credit. And I think that's going to go a long way to help people. I, I'm, re I'm really optimistic that this is going to help a lot of people for, for a while. What do you think? <laughs> I'm not a politician. I'm not, don't know politics. I also, I, I think I remember, and, and this is what my question is, if I'm remembering correctly, don't you also have some like educational program, I mean, maybe not now during COVID, but educational programs, literacy programs, work programs, that kind of thing, um, in addition to the, the food and the, that sort of? We do, we do. We temporarily suspended it during COVID, but then we adapted um, one of the programs that usually ran through Ohio Means Jobs. It's another partnership. Um, Ohio Means Jobs didn't run the program last summer, so we adapted our own so that we had some um, youth, 16 to 24 is the age range um, from poor families, needy families, um, come work with us for 25 hours a week. Um, they have stuck with it for many months. They're actually still, some of them are still with us. In, instead of having volunteers that do like three hours a month and having 300 volunteers, instead we moved it to having these three, we call them our Jedis, uh, job experience training interns. Um, but these Jedis, uh, spend more time every day. So we had a much, much smaller bubble, if that makes sense. So there are only 11 of us in the building all the time, um, instead of having all these volunteers coming in and out. Um, and that has been really, really exceeded my expectations for not only for how much they do for us, um, but also hearing what we have done for them and continue to do with them I just hear the staff talking with them about, you know, they ask questions about taxes or about if I want to get my own apartment, how much do I need? And um, what about insurance? Just lots of stuff. So, that, so it's, it's a really cool program. Um, 
that we're doing. And hopefully when maybe this summer we'll get the tutoring program going again, uh, we usually do that. Um, it just de it depends on what the schools do and uh, whether we're going to be able to be in person with people. Yeah. Go ahead, Ralph. Does the proximity uh, of OCS to family health dentistry lend itself to any cooperation between the two agencies? Yes, uh, we try to cross, cross reference people, yes. And a lot of times people will come front to us after an appointment there. Um, and or you know, if they're looking for medical help um, or complaining about being sick, we certainly tell them about health and dentistry. Mm -hmm. I wanna check in uh, since we have Sharon connecting by phone and I know sometimes it's hard to jump in when you're connected by phone. I just wanted to not put you on the spot, Sharon, but just check if there was anything you wanted to ask or add. No, the, um, the questions and the answers have been really, really insightful for me. And I just very much appreciate being able to uh, be a part of this. Thanks, Sharon. Other questions or just thoughts or reflections as you're listening to this or some of the material that we were talking about earlier? I would just like to say that um, I think Margie hit on it, but um, probably um, not to the full extent that one of the things that I think is so special about OCS is the way they go about providing the help um, that's much needed. Um, really keeping the integrity of the people that are coming to them for help in front and center um, and really trying to respect them um, and show them the proper respect that they deserve. Um, and I think that you don't always find that, um, you know, in, um, you know, I've been around a lot of nonprofits over the years and um, have been a part of nonprofits over the years. And that is one thing I always, um, look for is um, how they go about um, providing the care um, because that's really what it is. It's care for um, others um, in need. And, um, and it's not um, charity. Um, so I think that that's a really important um, part of OCS um, and the way that they are part of the community too. Um, and, not just meeting basic needs, but also really thinking about how um, OCS is a vital part of the community and how they can give back to the community um, in unique ways. Um, so I think that there's a lot <laughs> to OCS um, that isn't always seen um, from the outside. Um, so, just wanted to add that. Yeah, and thinking about, if I may, um, just thinking again about this, the Le Le Leviticus image of gleaners and thinking about um, Ruth was a gleaner, right? Um, and Ruth became big, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> understatement. Anyway, so I think, one, not judging because you never know who is there gleaning, um, but it's still hard work, right? Um, and being aware that the gleaners are have a place and that they're working hard and you never know who they are, um, but that you want being willing to share. I like, it's a nice image. Other thoughts as we approach the eight o'clock hour, but no rush. We're not having any rushing. There's enough rushing these days. It's going to be calm and serene. <laughs> well, OCS is one of Oberlin's real treasures. Amen. And it, it, 
it would be interesting. Uh, it's probably not even possible to take, you know, since you started, how many people have been helped through your agency? It's, it's, it's got to be in the thousands through the years, if not tens of thousands. And that makes our community a lot better because we have people now that at least have a foot, at least on the first rung, and then can be more productive and, and happier people and, you know, be able to, to become perhaps a little bit more self-reliant because somebody gave them that lift when they really needed. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's community. It's Oberlin community, right? It's the services that Oberlin community gives and we're supported by. Which I'll put in a plug for folks connected with First Church, whether you're a member or part of our extended family, First Church has a long tradition of supporting OCS, not just financially, but in people serving on the board and as volunteers. And as Margie said, um, it has been a challenge under COVID because volunteers can't do, there's no way to make that work, but um, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so I'm, it won't be that much longer before I imagine you'll be putting out the SOS for volunteers. So if you've listened to this conversation tonight and you've been inspired and said, I'd really like to be a part of that, um, pay attention for that SOS that will be coming. Also consider being a, a board member. I don't know if you need board members now, but there will be a time when that will happen. Um, it is a wonderful way not only to learn more about Oberlin Community Services, but to gain a much deeper and richer understanding of Oberlin and the surrounding community. Um, and to really help communicate to uh, the Oberlin community and beyond uh, what poverty means in this county and who are the folks that are really being served by OCS. There's sometimes a lot of confusion about that. If there aren't other comments, uh, uh, I'll just wrap us up tonight. Hey, a big thank you to Margie Flood. Thank you so much. That was thank just- Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you all and hear your stories. I have to confess that I listened in to your, one of, both of your other adult eds and I'm just really, really touched and moved by your sharing. On a lighter note, Margie and I had a fun email exchange earlier this week where um, some of you may be familiar with Monty Python where the segue is, and now for something completely different, we have decided the new segue is, and now to Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> and with that segue, um, next week, our guest uh, feature presenter will be Steve Volk, who is a emeritus professor of history from Oberlin College. We'll be taking a look at the story about the golden calf and exploring the question of who do you trust and how do you determine who you can trust? Wow. Uh, so I invite you to give that some reflection between now and then. Um, May I just say something? Yes. I apologize for skipping out. I had a phone call from a college roommate from Oberlin. I, oh. I was an Oberlin student and I just hadn't talked to her in so long. I just had to go and, <laughs> and chat. She's coming for a visit in a few weeks. Um, hey. She's fully vaccinated and so, so we're gonna get together. But I'm going to miss next week too because I am moving my harpsichord to the place where I will be performing on Friday night. So I. Uh, they have to move it late in the evening, so I won't be with you next week. But I'll, I'll catch up on the video later. There you go. <laughs> oh, we'll miss you, Marion. Thank you for being with us this evening. Let us uh, conclude this evening with a, a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for drawing together, for drawing us together in this moment this evening. Help us to be generous in our giving to others as neighbors, but also in our times of vulnerability and need to be willing and able receivers of the care from others so that in our giving and our receiving, we might be knit more fully and deeply together as your community, as your people. Grant us peace and rest this evening 
so we might arise refreshed tomorrow morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here tonight. Peace be with you. All right. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Peace be with you. Thank you. Okay.